to Unit 2, Level 2, MVQ, Certificate, Spectator Safety, Level 2. Right, so this is what we're going to go through today. Obviously, you should have already followed this one on Unit 1, which is great. Um, so, obviously, now it's just a little, uh, Module 2. So, this module now is Control the Entry, Exit, and Movements of People at Spectator Events. So, today, we're going to go through and I'm going to teach you how to control the exit, uh, entry and exit of people at events. How to search people for unauthorised items, know how to provide people with information and help with other problems. When you're doing this, ideally, you've got your uh, portfolio, whether it's on the, the computer and or um, hard copy. Go through this. Obviously, we'll go through the answers. This is obviously sequential. As it goes through, you'll know where we are. Um, any issues, I say, email GNR Training Limited at Gmail. Com. Right, know how to control the entry and exit of people. Basically what this means is, is people coming in and out of the stadium. Use of, those of you that have uh, ever worked into a stadium, in fact, those of you that have actually been to a stadium. As you go in there, as you go into the stadium, uh, obviously people say, yeah, okay, go through the turnstiles, you're getting searched. Um, and then obviously you have your ticket, see where you're sitting, and there you go. That is how to control, in, 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 control entry and exit of people. So. This is a common scene, if you've been to a festival, entry and exit. This is obviously an entry point, people going into there, uh, into the festival. What can you see from that picture? Well, from what I'm looking at, I can see lots of people going in. That can be, that can be an absolute nightmare if it is not controlled, if it's not contained, if there's no structure in place, if everyone just descends onto the place without any built barriers in there and cordons, anything on them sort of lines which we're going to go through, that there would be mayhem. Lucky enough, it is. Okay, right, so the first and first important part that you need to go through is going to be customer service. Being able to talk to people, being able to know what people want, because the first impressions that people get are of the stewards, are of you guys. They want to make sure that the individual you've got you, you represent a brand. This could be any this could be Wembley Stadium, Liverpool Football Club, Tottenham, it could be anybody. Doesn't matter if you work directly for the club or you actually work for another company. They are seen, you are seen as a ambassador, a person of that particular uh, football club or venue, in fact, wherever it may be. So it's all about customer service. So one of the most important aspects of Stewards role is to provide excellent customer service. Think of it this way, it's not only in stadiums, it's not only in MVQ, wherever you go, whatever job you do, wherever you wherever you go outside to eat, um, you go to a theme park, um, you go anywhere, you expect that person to give you good customer service. I bet if you think about it, you think, what's the most important thing to me? I bet most of you can probably say service, and that's what it all comes down to. Okay, And this is where people come back, this is where you get a good reputation, trip advisor. Okay, so the basics. Be professional with every customer. So basically, be professional. Treat, have, treat people how you expect to be treated. Be approachable. Don't stand there with an aggressive look on your face or your hands in your pockets. Be open. Be welcoming. Okay. Go out of your way to help customers. If you see someone who's nice, who's confused, go up to them. Are you okay, sir? Can I help you? You may get a no. You may get a square word back. But at least you go out there and say, are you okay? And if you approach them in the correct manner, with the right customer service, more or less, nine times out of ten, they'll say, no, I'm fine, thank you, or yes, can you help me do this? And that's what it's all about. And most importantly, this is the purpose of it. Leave customers pleased with how you are dealt with them. Think about a time when you've done something and you think, you know what, that individual, he treated me really well. I'm really happy with that. That's how you want to be. You want these people to say, shake your hand and say, thank you very much. That's the biggest compliment you can get in this industry, which is a handshake saying, guys, thank you very much. Had a great day. That means they've been looked after, great customer service. So, how, what's, what's the principles of it? So what is customer service? Customer service really comes down to three Ps. Okay, The first one is be polite. Hello, sir. How are you? Hello, madam. How are you? Can I help you today? Something along those sort of lines. Be positive, no matter what the problem is. It could be a problem where there's no new roll in the toilets, or they have um, lost their child. Anything along those sorts of lines. Be positive. So if someone comes up to you and says, um, let's say, uh, just let you know, um, I have lost my ticket. They go, oh no, don't worry about it. And say, I've lost your ticket. No worries. Listen, don't worry. Stick with me. I see if I can get this sorted and signpost them to where they are. It's that positive upbeat. But be professional. 
what professional means is basically just make sure that you are um, putting yourself across in a, in, a, in, a, in a professional way. Okay, so three P's: be polite, be positive, and be professional. So, what's poor customer service? I bet some of you have probably experienced poor customer service. All the poor customer service really is is a lack of commitment. People stand there with their hands in their pockets. You go and ask a question to someone, you say, oh, excuse me, can you tell me where this is, please? And they go, no, I don't know. That's poor customer service. Especially lack of concern. I've lost my mobile phone. Oh, well, not me. I've never lost my mobile phone. Poor customer service. Not listening to the customer. Making jokes or being rude. Ignoring them, appearing bored, and failing to do what you've promised. How many times have, has anyone listened to this? How many times have you ordered something and someone says to you, do you know what, it'll be delivered the next day. You you stand in, you take a day off work, you're in, and you're sitting there all day and you're waiting for it to come in, whatever it may be. It could be the gas man, it could be uh, a new mobile phone. And then when you ring up, you say, I'm sorry, it's been delayed. How poor customer service is that? Not only have you wasted a day, but they've um, communicated it to you. Okay, That's what poor customer service is. Do not be that person. Okay, so... That's all about customer service. Okay, that's, that's obviously the first part of it. As soon as they walk in, they will see you. They'll see that person with a smile on their face. Be positive, be polite. Hi, how are you? How can I help you? Okay, that's the first entrance. The next little step we're gonna move on to is obviously monitoring your area. Okay, so whilst you're actually giving customer service, while you're speaking to these individuals, it's important to monitor your area. Now your area could be anywhere. It could be a car park, it could be a turnstile, could be um, a queue, anything like that. You need to monitor it, and the main reasons why you've got to import, uh, you've got to uh, monitor it, is because you've got to facilitate an ordered and structured entry into the venue. That picture that you saw previously was of a festival, and how many people go to a festival? Ten thousand, twenty thousand, five thousand. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if there's two people going into there, into the into the uh, into the festival or into the venue. It doesn't matter. It needs to be ordered and structured. Otherwise, like I said before, it is chaos. For you that work in football, segregating rival supporters. I've been to many games where the, the rival supporters are there. Yes, they've been segregated, as in uh, segregated from the, uh, the the stands, or they or in the seating area. They could be in a different stand. But you also need to segregate them when you're out and about. Because obviously that's where most of the issues come from. Keeping evacuation routes clear. You you work in the stands or you work anywhere. No one is allowed to stand on a concourse. No one is allowed to stand near a fire exit because it is a legal requirement. And it also prevents overcrowding. So we're going to discuss how you monitor it as we move forward. But they are the key elements, okay? So how do you do this? Well, obviously you've got to monitor it. Monitoring just means observing. Being proactive. If you see somebody stopped... Looking confused. Hi, can I help you? Yes, I can. Okay. Do you mind just walking over to the uh, over here for a second? That's to stop the flow. So obviously when people stop, I'm sure you might get it. Come the underground. Um, in London, if you live in London, um, or you're in a train station, or you're walking down the high street and someone just stops because their shoelace is undone, or they're on a mobile phone. What happens to everybody behind? It just causes carnage. The motorway for you that drive, you get a vehicle that breaks. Two miles down the road, it comes to a complete standstill, okay? And interacting with customers. All it is, body language. Oh, are you okay? Thumbs up. Yes, yes, yes. They want a bit, a bit of reassurance. Okay, so that's, the, that's what we're going to talk about. Importance of the monitoring that, that area. So, when people come into entry, not only with your customer service, okay? What have you got to do? You've got to check tickets and wristbands. Who's it been to concerts? You've been to festivals. I don't know, even if you've been away uh, abroad, been to Alton Towers. Any of those type of places. Oh, by the way, I, d I don't get um, I don't get any money for uh, Mick pitching these. It's just what comes to my mind. I'm not in any marketing scheme. Um, so checking tickets and, and, and wristbands. Can I see your ticket? Yes, great. Fantastic. Actually, no. You're in the next turnstile. No, you're in the entrance there. Actually, no. This is for tomorrow. Something along those lines. Wristbands. No. That's where the briefing comes in. What tickets are allowed in? What colour wristbands are allowed in? Okay, this is where the briefing comes in that we talked about from Unit One. Advising on event alcohol policy. That could be made, that could be different. You will learn throughout this course, and you'll know at the end of it, that alcohol is not allowed to be drunk in front of pitch. Not allowed to drink in view of the pitch. If you go to a concert, you can have as many drinks as you want. Okay, so you have to remember that. Again, briefing, that's the most important part. And any items which contravene venue rules. So we've got band, 
or prohibitive and illegal items. We will talk about that a little bit later. So why have you got to do it? To enable you to identify and react to any issues. One of the biggest things you can probably find at a football game is the away fans or the home fans being in the away end or vice versa. It's actually illegal for that to happen. It's actually illegal for that to happen. You can notice it. Biggest way of noticing it is talking to people. If you have a, um, two clubs and they're from different ends of the country, so um, north and, and south, Subject to obviously them having the, the accents and look at it this way, it's not it's not foolproof, but you have someone that goes into the home end with a London accent or a southern accent or, or someone that goes into the other end with a, with a northern accent. That should be an indicator. Hold on a minute. Are you allowed in now? Not because of an accent, because it's just put it together. But you ask the question. Hello, sir, can I help you? Yes. And if he's got um, the away shirt on or he's got the home shirt on and he's in the away end, that's, that's asking for trouble. Just little things like that, you've got to be honest, because at the end of the day, if you don't deal with this at the start, you'll have to deal with it inside, and it's a lot harder to deal with it inside than what it is to deal with it at the start. Providing information on group dynamics. This is key, major key. You guys are the guys on the ground. You need to be looking, thinking to yourself, right, okay, or oh, does that person look a bit suspect? Does that person look a bit intoxicated? Is that person maybe carrying something? Is that person, you heard them talking about something? You fire it up the chain, tell your supervisor. What does that mean? It enables them to keep an eye on them, control them, put cameras on them. Eyes and ears on the ground, guys. Identify signs of distress. We'll talk about that, signs of distress. The biggest, the biggest way to talk about signs of distress is if someone's not happy. That means someone's standing there flapping their arms around. But look on, on faces. It's all body language. It speaks a thousand words. So, what do we do? We have to supervise. When people are coming in, this is what we're looking for. So, what's your job? Your job is to risk assess the queue. Thinking to yourself, right, is there, is there too many people in there? Is there um, that group there? They look a bit, mm, bit, bit suspect. Risk assess it. Communicate um, entry restrictions. Have tickets ready. Ensuring correct blame turnstile. This is the best thing, being proactive. This is where the proactiveness comes in. You're standing there and you've got a group of people and you know that that's VIP tickets, say for the left and VIP ticket or, or normal tickets to, to, to the right. You can stay there. Right, have you got a VIP ticket or a normal ticket? Obviously, I've got a VIP ticket. Okay, to the left, to the right. And everyone says, well, where am I going, mate? That's where you need to be going. Yeah, so you go there. So VIP to the left, normal to the right. Whatever it may be, okay, just using them as examples. Interact with customers. They love this. Customers, spectators, people, they love it. They know they've got to stand in the queue. Any of you who've ever been to Disney World or, or Disneyland, the queues are horrendous, okay? But they have people who come along and talk to you. It passes the time away. Plus, as well, when they get in there, when they get to the gate, they're all friendly, they're all nice. There's no issues, okay? Less, less likely getting complaints. Proactive in assisting people look, look, look lost, anxious, or confused. Confused. You see someone standing there with a ticket, you're going, Oh, where are I? Don't just look at them, go up to them. Oh, so, can I help you? Yes, actually, I'm in, I'm in this. Right, you go all the way around the stadium. Or, yes, just straight the head, sir. That, examples of that, okay? When you talk to someone, take them to one side, so not to impede the crowd, as I said before. You see someone standing in the middle of the road, this happens on the underground, or even on traffic grounds. People look down, they stop. They do not have an understanding that, of the issues that they will cause. That's what you're there for. So, so that way, come over here, I can help you move to the side. Be vigilant and looking for hazards and obstructions. People leaving stuff on the floor. People leave anything around. We'll talk to you in unit one about, obviously, suspect packages. Look for bags that have been discarded. Are they sinister or not? Where possible, keep crowds moving. That's why all these times people turn and say, right, come on, keep going, keep moving, don't stop, so let's go. And they say, wait for my friend. Yes, my friend will catch in, not a problem at all. And there's a reason for that, because it just causes a big blockage. Okay. So, how do we actually get people in? What, what sort of methods do we use to get people in? So, the first one is going to be a barrier. What is a barrier? A barrier is normally a metal structure, which is these barriers here that you can see on the end here. They have little hooks on where they all log in or, or, or click in. What that basically means, that, that then forms a permanent um, uh, stopping mechanism, to look for, for a better word, a permanent way to stop people. So if you don't want someone to go into a certain direction or you want them to be filtered into wherever it may be, so for example, you're like a bottleneck. 
So if you imagine that you're coming into um, in, into a place or wherever it may be, and you see these metal bars at the side, but then they come in from large and then just slowly filter into a one lane. That's known as a barrier. It's a filter barrier. A barrier is a permanent structure. It, it can be moved, but nine times out of ten, it's there as a as a permanent method. The opposite to that would be a cordon. A cordon is a temporary measure. Normally, it's a temp. A cordon is, um, as it's in here, is obviously done by individuals, um, like stewards, hold hands or not, not hold hands, hold hands. But you stand there and you create a cordon. It's a temporary structure. It acts exactly the same as a barrier, but as with people, you let go, you walk away, and there. That could be a temporary thing. That could be a fact that you don't want someone to go to a certain location because it's too busy, or um, yeah, it's too busy. So you put in a, a, a human cordon, stops people from going there. And then the other way of controlling entry, which most of you have probably gone through, is a turnstile. This turnstile happens to be at Wembley Stadium, but any turnstile, this stops people entry. What it actually does, it controls the rate of flow of people that go into this, the turnstiles. A little fact that many people who hear people do or don't know about a turnstile, you can actually set a timer of how many people you want in per minute. So what that means is when you put your turnstile, when you put your ticket in the turnstile and it opens, it will go round at a certain speed and reset itself. I think the average is around about five seconds. They want to get people in, but when it starts getting really busy, they can get it up to around about ten seconds, and that stops the flow massively. That's another way of doing it. Okay. But that's an idea of a turnstile. Ticket goes in, you go in, it counts people. So people that obviously know uh, how many people are actually in the uh, in the stadium. So what's the key element for you guys? Communication, as we said. Okay, being proactive, observing, be calm, reassuring, and have a bit of a presence. So what that basically means is, so if there is a bit of a rush, if there is a little bit of a situation potentially brewing, don't get panicky about it. Just go over there. Yes, no worries, don't worry, we'll be in very soon. Now, if you'd like to just step away, we'll move it out of the way. Everyone reacts to you. You guys will have a high vis jacket on, no matter what job you're doing. SI, steward, supervisor, you'll have a high vis jacket. People will see you. Most individuals see a high vis jacket and they think to themselves, oh, that person looks a little bit of like authority. They would expect a good answer from you, okay? This is obviously the idea behind what we're trying to achieve. So, what we've got here, this is another uh, this idea, this is Wembley Stadium. I'll play this video very, very quickly, just so you can get an understanding of what we're talking about. So what's happening here, this is at Wembley, walking up Olympic Way. There you go, this is a controlled entry. So what's happening is people, as we're looking at it behind us, is Wembley Stadium um, train station, Wembley Park, and they are now walking up uh, Olympic Way. What you can see in this video are police officers and stewards that are along here. The reason for this is that it actually separates individuals. It, it actually that is what's known as a who will know a cordon barrier, a filter barrier, but with a cordon because it's people. If it was actually a barrier, it would be metal structures. This would be a barrier because it's a permanent structure. This is temporary. Okay, so that's that one. That's entry. And then very similar to exit, same place. This is on a football match. Here we go. See on here you'd have signs so people know where they're going and because everyone's leaving they want to get there. There will probably not, won't be any barriers or so unless it gets too busy. Even the police are moving out of the way there. So you see the difference. They were there on entry to try and control people coming in. Upon leaving they're moving out the side because obviously a lot more people are coming up. There you go. That's controlled entry and controlled exit in its entirety. So that's that module. Okay, so what we're looking at is there, we're looking at how people come into a stadium. What do you, what's your role? What do you do to get someone into a stadium? Well, like we said, just a bit of a recap. We're now looking at customer service. We're now looking at how you speak to people, what you do, the importance of it. It makes people feel at ease. And when people get into the stadium, they're happy, they're ready to go. Think about how you would want to be spoken to when you was going into a, a site or in a venue. And then mirror that. Then we look to obviously cordons, turnstiles, why there are cordons there, why you can't go that way. If anyone's ever been to West Ham United, um, the New London Stadium, on the actual game itself, you cannot walk through Westfield Shopping Centre. You have to walk all the way around. And, that's, and that is actually done with a cordon. 
actually put people there to stop uh, individuals walking through Westfield. So there you go, that's the reason why it controls them, so they're not in the shops, um, it doesn't get busy. They don't, uh, don't, don't cause any carnage in there, they actually have to walk around, okay? Uh, so you do that, checking tickets, being proactive, that's the main purpose. Now, the next step we're going to go on to is searching. So, this may happen inside the stadium, may happen outside the stadium, Much more likely it will happen at a turnstile, i.e. an entrance point, okay? So why do we search? You look for banned or, or uh, prohibited items and illegal items, which we'll go through and determine what they are. Confirm entry requirements are adhered to. An entry requirement could be, for example, um, you must uh, have no alcohol, um, no weapons, no drugs. You conduct a search to make sure that person hasn't got anything that will contravene the uh, stadium rules. An effective CT procedure. CT stands for counter-terrorism. Counter-terrorism procedure. So counter-terrorism is making sure that people haven't got anything that may cause harm uh, to me, you, or anybody else. Which includes, yes, the standard explosives, IEDs, but also includes weapons, knives, something that's sort of like just counter-terrorism. Okay? The search policy, there are three types of search. You've got general, specific, and random. Now let me indicate what these are. So general is basically, at a turnstile, everyone comes through, it's a general search. Everybody gets searched, no one gets left out. A random search is some but not all customers, so one in five people. Uh, a lot of football clubs use this as targeted searching outside the stadium. So they'll look at big groups of guys saying, sorry, can I just search two of you over here? That's cause or issue, of course it does. However, that is random and targeted search, whereas general is everyone. Then you've got specific search. I've conducted a few of these in the past. Where we'll get called on the radio and we believe this person has drugs on them or this person may have weapons on them. It doesn't mean that the guys at the turnstile haven't done the search correctly, which means they've managed to sneak it in. So we have a specific search where we pinpoint one person and say, Sorry, sir, sorry, madam, can we come and conduct a search? Why? Why is this? Why? Why? Why have we got to do that? Well, we believe you have XYZ. I'll give you a clue. I was working at a football uh, stadium um, and actually there was uh, three guys who were in the stands uh, taking drugs, blatantly in front of the camera. We conducted a search and we found drugs in them, and obviously they were ejected. And that's what's known as a specific search. We're specifically looking for something. So, what are those things we're actually looking for? Well, the first one we're looking for is going to be prohibited items. These are things that are not illegal to carry around with you. They're not. So you wouldn't get arrested by the police if you got caught with them in the street. Um, however, they are things that are not allowed in under the venue policies. Again. You'll get this as part of your briefing because some venues change. Some venues allow alcohol in, some don't. Some people allow this in, some people don't. Some people have flags in, along those sort of lines. Okay. So the common items are prohibited items: air horns, voo voo zellers. If you ever work in these places, the last thing you want to hear is a voo voo zeller noise. Obviously, alcohol. Alcohol is not allowed in. Audio and visual recording equipment. Basically what that is, is professional cameras. You do, you do not want people bringing in that can record things or visual. What the biggest thing is happening now with betting scams is actually people with phones and recording it and playing it back. So obviously that's the main thing. So all the ones underlined are the ones that are important. Flags over 2.5 metres, that's a safety hazard, unless it's actually been pre-arranged. Um, which means they have an email from the club saying they can bring it in. It actually needs a fire safety certificate. If it doesn't have this, you cannot bring it in. Glass vessels, cans and flasks, laser devices, obviously you know, uh, pointed in front of people, transmitting devices and unauthorised flyers. It's actually illegal, without permission, to give out flyers or information unless the club has approved it. That's whether or not it's free and or sold. And obviously you have, next to there, all prohibited items, they're things that you would never get caught or never get into trouble for, for carrying, maybe laser devices near an airport, but they're sort of things that you wouldn't necessarily get into trouble for, for carrying in everyday life. However, illegal items are exactly as what they say, you would get arrested. So we're looking at fireworks and flares in a built-up area, smoke canisters, drugs, offensive weapons, and any article that may be used as a weapon and or compromise public safety, baseball bat, knuckle duster, they're all illegal items, okay? So, how to search. So before we talk about what you do, that's what you're actually looking for. So how do you search? Well, actually, you have no legal right to search customers. That means if someone actually refuses to be searched, you stop. You don't do not let them in. Well, I'm not going to get searched. It's a condition of entry. Failure to comply with that means they will not come in. Yes, it's that simple. 
Then there's another four piece. So make sure you're polite, as we said before. No search you mind if I search you. No problem. Get permission. You must get permission. Without permission, it's classed as an assault. Permission comes from, sorry, sir, do you mind if I search you? Why is that? It's a condition of entry. Do you mind? Yes, I don't mind. There you go. That's permission. Have a positive approach. Tell them, even though you are invading their space, you are touching them. Think of it as a positive ma manner. What's the reason why you're doing this? Talk to them about something. Oh, I can't believe I, you know I'm saying being searched. Yes, but we're doing it to everyone so we know that you're safe and I'm safe. And then be professional. But above all, make sure it's same-sex searching only. Men should not search females, and females should not search men. The only time that would be okay is if it's a wand, like a metal wand. Alternatively, you're searching a bag. But if you're physically putting hands on somebody, a man cannot put a hand, man on, on, on a woman, and even and a woman cannot put a hand uh, on a man to do a search, even with permission. You just open up yourself massively. You may come a time you have to search under 18s. You can pause this and have a read through this in its entirety. But under 18s is very simple. Obviously, you must identify yourselves who you are. Okay, because to an under 18, that's classed as a, a still classed as a child, it may not be obvious. You may have someone that may be 12. You may have someone that's 18. Okay, but all this comes from us. All this comes from the club's policy. So obviously, follow this. But if you do have to search people, I know that there's a lot of. Um, clubs out there also do a search probably only around about 14 to 16 years old but make it known who you are explain the reason for the search because they might not know nine times out of ten they're going to maybe with an adult or a guardian get their permission first ask if they're carrying anything that might be dangerous nine times out of ten they'll go yeah I, I actually do have this because they're children ask them if anyone's asked them to carry something one of the key things with football hooligans currently at the moment is they have an old school risk lot and they also have a youth lot they get a lot of the youth to bring in the pyros, the drugs, and so on and so on. They do not think that they're going to get searched. Uh, one club, I think, has a, um, a risk youth group of around about 12 to 15-year-olds. Um, they believe they're not going to get searched. But if we believe they will get searched, that's what's known as a specific search. Ask them to empty their pockets. You do not touch them. You cannot touch an under-18. Ask them to take off their outer jackets. And they should, as it said down, they should not touch children during the search. And the young person is to self-search. Empty out your pockets. Go down their legs. You cannot touch the individual. Again, even with permission. So, what do you do if you find banned or prohibited items? In the workbook, it does say prohibited. So, prohibited is the same as banned. And banned is the same as prohibited. Pro prohibited okay? So, banned items. Just say prohibited items. If you be a seized banned item, you inform the customer why. Someone's walked in with a camera. Someone's walked in with a laser device. They're prohibited items. You take them off them. Seek further instructions from your supervisor. If you're not sure if that thing, if that is allowed in or not, that's what your supervisor is there for. Hello, supervisor. Um, is this person allowed this in? Actually, I would actually say pass it on to your supervisor. That's what they get paid to do. You found it. Pass it on to the supervisor. They will then deal with it. And then record the find. What that basically means is put it in the notebook or put it in an incident, or it might be a tally, but make sure you record it, because then that goes for statistics. If there's anything that's illegal, drugs, knives, weapons, anything on them sort of lines, refuse entry, because you do not want that coming in. Secure the item and tell them why. Seek further instructions for your supervisor. There you go. Tell your supervisor again. That's exactly what they're there for. The other alternative is if there is police and someone's got a, a knife on them, tell the police. The police will then come over and assist. Um, and obviously after that record it make sure you write it down it's important that you write it down because obviously that again comes down for statistics and if it's an illegal item it could go to court so remember this when it comes to searching explanations must be given for the search or the seize items you can't just take it off someone and when someone says why would you do that oh because I've been told to no tell them why because they might actually then remember and think to themselves I'll go and put that back in the car and I'll be back no problems at all remember if they're getting searched inside the stadium, you find something on them, they cannot leave the stadium and come back in, only at the turnstiles. Same-sex search, men search men, female search um, females. Searching of under-18s, remember, you cannot touch the child. That person has to then empty out their pockets. And also make sure that you're aware of venue procedures, including what banned and prohibited items are. This all is obtained in the brief. You cannot take something off of someone if it's okay on the list. So... 
I've covered searching. Now we're going to talk about refusing entry um, and excluding people or taking out. So what, why, why would you exclude someone? The simple answer is refusal to be searched. I don't want to be searched. Okay, fine, then you can't come in. All right, well, I won't, I won't come in. Fantastic. It never happens that way. In my experience, it never happens that way, but it could happen. Possession of banned or legal items. They've got something on them. Maybe you haven't done a search. You've just seen someone with something. People with banning orders. What a banning order is, a club will issue a banning order for individuals that have got past trouble or they are prolific offenders. Um, someone told me once that uh, they put someone on a banning order um, and I think... Uh, uh, the same day that person was back in front of them. So there's, there you go, it doesn't make sense. And intoxicated persons, under licensing act, it's actually illegal to be uh, intoxicated in a stadium as it is with anywhere else. Now, if you actually ask that person to leave, they're actually known as trespass. So what is tres trespass? It's being in a stadium without the correct authorization or breaking the venue rules. So let's say, for example, you come across someone who is... Um, has a, a banned item, you told them they, they, they don't want to give it up to you, so you tell them to go. They do not leave. As soon as you've taken that permission away, they are now classed as trespassing. That then effectively means that they can be ejected. However, we will talk about that in the conflict management mod, uh, model. So, that's refusing entry. That's the reasons why we do do it. So, the next section is... In your book, as we're following down the uh, portfolio, is know how to provide people with information and help with other problems. Because not all the time are you going to come across what we've just covered this morning. You're not going to come across individuals that are banned or people who've got prohibited or legal items. You're going to come across people that might actually want to know what sort of information, where certain things are. So, how do we do that? But it comes down to three elements. It's visual, content and vocal. So, what is visual? Visual is actually seeing, seeing people in distress. Seeing that um, someone says, where are the toilets? You point to a sign, you can see a sign. You have not even got to say anything. They can see the sign, but they just don't know where to look. The content. Content is the type of things that you're telling them. Make sure it's factual. Make sure it's above all understandable. And make sure that it is exactly what they want to hear. That's why it's important that you listen to them. And vocal, what you can't be doing. You cannot speak in a timid, in a uh, passive way. Again, you cannot talk in an aggressive way. Be assertive. If someone needs sitting down, tell them they're sitting down. Do not be coming in aggressive. If you go in aggressive, the, the only result of that is that they're going to be more aggressive towards you. And if they're passive, i.e. they're very, very timid, they're not going to listen to you. But again, we will cover this in the uh, conflict ma um, management module. So, how do you deal with different types of people? As a steward, you will deal with many types of people. For example, cooperative, uncooperative, intoxicated, emotional, individuals with limited understanding of English. That's a very common thing now. A lot of clubs where they're having, um, especially the European leagues, or even they're having um, uh, foreign players. These players will come over and they'll have a certain particular um, following of, of individuals that come from their own countries. For example, Tottenham have about 2,000 uh, um, North Korean fans, sorry, Southern Korean fans, uh, for some. Um, they, they, their understanding of English is actually quite limited. Uh, VIPs and individuals with particular needs. So, how do we actually speak with these individuals? How do we need to be? So, as it says on here, I won't go through them all, but you can obviously read them. You've got cooperative. It's a professional approach. They're being cooperative. What does that mean? Cooperative means that they're actually prepared to do what you want them to do. Being uncooperative is assertive. Again, it's not aggressive. It's telling them the facts. You have to sit down because it's the rules and regulations. Think of it. Think of Hillsborough. What's the reason why that happens? Everyone was standing. People that are intoxicated, you need to be patient. If you've ever spoke to anyone that is intoxicated, it takes them a lot longer for them to get their words out. Um, individuals with limited understanding of English, check their understanding. Show them empathy. Be courteous towards them. Individuals with particular needs, be calm and active listening. One thing I will say, people with needs, is if somebody is in a wheelchair, make sure you get on their level. Do not stand above them and talk down to them. Get on your, get on the uh, hunch down or, or sit down if you can and look them in the eye. It makes it things a whole lot easier. So, what information might a customer need? So these people will go in the stadium, they haven't read it, they don't know what's going on. They will go see someone with a high vis jacket and they expect that you will have the answers. Well, the information is very simple, what you need to give them. The first bit you need to see is obviously event start and finish time. If there's any breaks, what time half time is. If there's a concert, what time each acting. This information comes from the briefing. 
This is why you have your notebook and you write this down. Where the nearest toilet is, okay? Um, obviously, that's a very key one because at some point people will want to go to the toilet. But the accessible toilet, who has a key? If anyone knows an accessible toilet, um, there'll be a, a, what's known as a radar key. You need to know. It's all very well telling somebody that's where the accessible toilet is. But if they don't have a key, they cannot get in. Where is the nearest food, drink, betting, merchandising kiosk? Surround yourself with it. When you go there, when you're doing your pre-event checks, when you're walking around the stadium, make a mental note or even write it down where these things are. If someone says to you, can you tell me where this is, and you don't know, but you've got it in a notebook, fantastic. No worries. Nearest cash point, if there is one. This is a big one. Where the nearest first aid point is. Someone falls over and hurts themselves. You need to know a where to go for the first aid or when to send where to send somebody. And also customer service because if there's something that you can't deal with, you must send them to the customer service point. We got to what, what's the procedure for dealing with lost, found, or vulnerable adult? We will talk about it a little bit later on. And where the nearest station is for onwards journey. So when someone says to you, "I need to know where the nearest station is," ask the question. What's, what line do you need? If there's only one train that comes out of that station, fantastic. But if you're in a London stadium, there could be two, three um, sta stations around. And what line do you want to go to? The last thing you want to do is send someone that wants to go on a Jubilee line um, and then send them to where the Bakerloo line is. So, what information do we not give? How many security personnel in attendance? This is all counter-terrorism stuff. So, number of security personnel in attendance. Does it matter? Chances are you might not even know where the VIP players and entrances are unless they have the correct accreditation. Code words. We discussed this in Unit 1. What are code words there for? Code words are there to not panic anybody, to make sure that nobody actually understands that if you're calling a code red, or sorry, a call code black, it actually means that it could be a suspect package, whatever the, whatever the code word may be. Personal details of your own colleagues. That someone says, what's that person's name? Don't tell them the name. Every person should have a bib number or a number on their bib. That relates to that individual. Do not ever give out your name unless you want to. That's your choice. So, why should information not be given? Again, like I said, it's counter-terrorism. Okay? So, dealing with customers' problems. This is the next section we've got. So, what sort of customers' problems may a customer have in an event? Because not always is someone going to say to you, so, so, can you tell me where the, uh, where the toilet is? Yes, it's over there. They may actually say to you, I've got a problem, I've lost this, I've lost my phone, whatever it might be. Okay? So, these are the type of things you're going to have. Missing children or persons, that's a big one. Someone will come up to you and say, I have lost my dad, I've lost my mum, I've lost my child, wherever it may be. Lost property, I've lost my phone, I've lost my ticket, I've lost my car keys. Um, unsociable behaviour. Unsociable behaviour, which we will talk about in the next section. Unsociable behaviour will be something on the lines of spitting, drinking, um, swearing, that type of thing. And obviously ticketing problems. My ticket doesn't work, there's someone in my seat, whatever it may be. They're the sort of problems you're going to be dealing with. So, what do you need to do to do this? You need to get all the relevant information to solve that problem. Why? It prevents misunderstanding. If someone's ticket doesn't work and you haven't got the information and you think that ticket is a fake one, it's going to cause a lot more dramas. So what you need to do is prevent, so if you get much information, it prevents misunderstanding. And it's important to enable a resolution to be delivered. That person might just want a little, just wants to vent. That person may have had his drink, uh, dropped his drink, he just wants to know where the nearest kiosk is. So make sure you listen. God gave you two ears and one mouth. Use it that way. So, how do we deal with customer problems? This is how we do it. We listen. We listen to the problem. We do not interrupt them. They say, oh, what's the problem? You let them speak. You let them give you all the information. You emphasise. What that means is you don't actually give them sympathy. You say, right, okay, no worries at all. I can imagine that feels really bad. Someone's lost their mobile phone. What do you say, for example? I personally would say, you know what? I lost my phone the other day. All my pictures of my children on it. It's the, it's, the, it's the bad thing in the world. These people just want to know that you have an understanding. Ask questions if they haven't given you the information. So, where was you last? If they say to you, I was over there, what seat was you in? Probe in these questions. Paraphrase. What paraphrase means is they've given you a long, long story. You just need to take out the good, uh, the, the, the good bits. You just need to take out the bits that are relevant. For example, someone's lost their mobile phone. Nine times out of ten, they'll tell you where they did it, what time they're coming to the stadium. What pictures they have on it. Is that information relevant? Not really. The information you need to know is where they were sitting, what the phone looks like, and where they have been when they actually realise they've lost it. That gives you an understanding of it. And then you summarise. So you repeat the whole thing. So again, 
That is the that is the mnemonic known as leaps. Listen, emphasize, ask questions, paraphrase, and summarize. That is how you deal with problems. In the scenarios, <clears throat> in the scenarios, there will be problems. We will go through this, and I will expect to see you guys use the leaps. Okay, how do you handle complaints? Well, first of all, you use leaps again. First of all, you got to acknowledge what the customer complaint is. Don't just don't just go, yeah, cheers, thanks very much. Someone's lost their phone. Well, I've never lost my phone. That's silly. That's not answer. That's poor customer service. Listen, evaluate, and assess the complaint. Is the complaint, can you deal with it? Do you have the power to deal with it? Or do you have to pass it on to the supervisor? Or do you have to pass it on to customer services? Either way, it doesn't matter. Make sure you get that information. In an ideal world, you would pass it on to somebody else and they were you to carry on doing your job. Uh, doing your job. If not, as I say, turn to supervisor or your customer services. So, last but no means least, we have a disability. I don't um, at the moment, um, but obviously people may have a uh, people come there that may have a disability. Um, so, how do you know if someone has a disability? The fact is, we don't. No longer can you say that someone has a disability that someone's in a wheelchair or someone is on crutches. Some disabilities are not always visible. Okay, not always visible. So if someone says to you, I have a disability, you cannot say, no, you don't. You say, okay, no worries, what would you like me to do? And who can use the accessible platform in a toilet? You'll have um, accessible platforms in some stadiums and accessible toilets. The answer is anybody. You cannot refuse anybody to use an accessible toilet. If they have a key or they don't have a key and they say, I need to use an accessible toilet, you let them go in now. That's all you do. So that is unit two all finished. What we've got to look at here is obviously talking about crowds, entry, exit, how you deal with problems, how you deal with people. This is all about movements um, on that sort of side of it. Okay, so that's unit two. Again, any issues, give us an email and we'll answer them. Thank you very much.